to the underwater workshop and this is designed to teach you the fundamentals of underwater uh, robotics and then uh, we're actually going to build up a robot and we have a pool outside and you get to go outside and drive it underwater. So my name is Ray Holt, I'm president of STEM Advancement and we sponsor various workshops on STEM. So robotics, underwater, drones, uh, and we have competitions and many of you have attended. This is Dr. Kevin McCone. This is his classroom. He's been here at uh, Colin 22 years. Wow. <laughs> <laughs> and he's always gracious and letting us have workshops here. This is Miss. This is Rachel McDonald. She's the outreach coordinator for the Dolphin Island Sea Lab. Who knows where Dolphin Island is? Yay! All right. <laughs> well, I hope you go there. I went to the one two years ago, loved it. Did not want to leave the island. It happened to be a beautiful day. It was. It was a great weekend for the competition. So the competition she'll be telling you about is down there, April 23rd Third, and 24th. Yeah. So hopefully from this experience, you'll be able to form a team and go down. So the plan is to uh, fill you with knowledge for one, two, two and a half hours. And in that meantime, you'll be building uh, underwater robots. And before or after we go to the pool, we'll take a lunch break. And then um, Dr. Kevin has entered college teams in the international underwater competition for many years and has placed fifth and above, fourth and above several times. So this school has international uh, winning underwater robotic teams. And he has agreed to show us their lab and some of their previous robots. So it should be a very interesting day. So I'll turn it over to Miss Rachel. Kevin was going to do a couple oh. of announcements real quick. Oh, yes. Yeah, so just, just, a, just a couple things and uh, just to announce from the school. Again, I'm Kevin McCone. So if you need anything, I'm uh, just hosting today. Um, Restrooms, if you need restrooms, uh, there are, um, there's no restrooms on the second floor. The well designed building, thank you. On the first floor, right below us, there's a male uh, bathroom. There is what we call the annex. You'll see there's a, a addition to the back part of this building. On the first floor, on the annex, there's a female uh, bathroom in one hall and then a male bathroom in another. I'll be happy to show you where those are at. Also, you're more than welcome to use the faculty. Uh, back of the offices, there's uh, two bathrooms uh, down there and a uh, pot of coffee down there if, uh, if you want to uh, some coffee. Um, we would like you to do the best you can social distancing on campus. Um, if you are in a family and you want to you know, work together or sit together, certainly we have some chairs uh, over there. Hand sanitizer uh, on, the, uh, on the front up there. I told Ms. Rachel I do have some face masks if you uh, feel uncomfortable and want a face mask while you're working. Uh, with uh, building and things like that, we uh, do have access uh, to those. When we're outside, uh, everything is good to go, but as long as we're on the inside, we do want to continue to practice uh, uh, masking, and I don't have my mask on, but social uh, social so, so, so. Lunch, uh, some people were asking about lunch. If you're not familiar with Wesson, there's not a whole lot in Wesson. There is a diner uh, on North 51. There's also Dump's Barbecue. And there's a couple gas stations that have, uh, you know, the Hunt's Pizza, chicken, uh, potato logs, things like that. Brookhaven's about 15 minutes south of here, and they got windy and McDonald's and all that kind of stuff, too. So if you need some suggestions for lunch or things like that, uh, let me know. I'll be happy to. Thank you all for coming uh, to Colvin. And uh, if there's anything I can do to get help you, just let me know. You're welcome. Okay, right. thank, thank you, Kevin. Thank you, Ray. Yes. Oh, perfect. So as, let me see if I can get this going. A little 
do next on the other one? Okay, now it's going. Perfect. So as you said, my name is Rachel McDonald, and I um, have a few different titles on the website. I think it is Outreach Coordinator, and what I commonly call myself is the ROV Composition Coordinator. That is mostly what I do at the Dauphin Island Sea Lab. I'm a part of the Education Department. So those of you that have been to Dauphin Island Sea Lab, what have you done there? I know you raised your hand. Um, we went to the, the it was one of the Sea Lab, but it was, it was also um, is it our aquarium? Yeah. Okay. We have a public yeah. aquarium called the Estuarium. Yeah. It is in the process of being renamed as the Aquarium of Alabama. So we were granted that title by the state of Alabama, being the research facility and education building um, for marine scientists for the state of Alabama. Yeah. So we do have a public aquarium. Yeah. And then we also have the, uh, the birds of the estuary. Bird sanctuary. Yeah. That. yeah. yeah. That we walk around that. Yeah. Great. Who else have been? You guys knew Dolphin Island. Have you been to Dolphin Island? No? Okay. Oh, no. Yeah. Well, hopefully you get another chance to visit. So we do kind of have three entities, and we do focus on the state of Alabama. I do often get to come to Mississippi through the Mississippi Alabama Sea Grant. So if you're familiar with the Sea Grant program, they do, they are joint states. So I do get to come over here, and that's how I got to meet Ray, which is some funding that allowed me to travel into Mississippi. Um, we do some public outreach where we do travel around, mainly around the state of Alabama, visiting Title I schools, and we take marine science into the classroom there, which is great, and there are a lot of students, you know, that can't always travel to the coast. You guys have a great facility in Mississippi, you know, and as the Gulf Coast Research Lab, they don't have a traveling outreach van, but you also have the Mississippi Aquarium that just opened that I believe does. You're getting some great other marine science options locally in your state, which is just fantastic. So my background is marine science. So I am originally from Missouri, I don't sound like I'm from the South, or maybe I don't as much. Uh, my husband is from here, so sometimes I hear myself talking more like him, um, and that's okay. He's from Phoenix City, so small town, Alabama. Uh, but I wanted to do marine science since I was a little kid, always was interested in biology, some chemistry, though he would have told me I liked chemistry as a kid, I would have been like, no, I don't like it at all. That was, you know, a scary word that I was uh, intimidated by as a child. Um, but I went to a small private school in Alabama and they sent me to the sea lab for the summer. So we do have um, residential undergraduate marine science courses. So all the different schools across the state of Alabama can send students down to the sea lab to take undergraduate classes for the summer, which is a great opportunity. You're getting to live on the island in our dorm facilities and do those classes. And then I stayed. So then I did a master's in marine science at the Dawson Island Sea Lab. Once I finished that, what I really discovered that I enjoyed was I was missing the public side and missing working with students. I'd always done that growing up, doing some outreach of different types. I worked with inner city kids in Birmingham, doing tennis, and I just missed that interaction. So then I switched to the education side, and I've been in our education department for about six years now. So slowly worked my way through that. And my position in there has always been the ROV competition. Um, so I head up our underwater robotics program, and I've gotten to do a lot of training and different professional developments along the way to make sure that I was up to speed on what I was doing since I came from the marine side as opposed to the robotic side. So it's been a lot of fun getting to learn all of that. So I'm excited to get to share that with you. These are some of the fun places or things that I've gotten to see on the way. These are my favorite picture. So the one on the right is from the Mate ROV International Competition a few years ago. That is in the NASA Neutral Buoyancy Lab in Houston, Texas. And so that is a full-size replica of the International Space Station in the water behind me. And we, the kids, got to, the students, got to drive their ROVs in that pool. They got to meet some of the people that worked there. It was just a phenomenal opportunity. So our theme that year for the competition was inner and outer space. So how are they training astronauts and what are they doing underwater to send stuff in space? So we did a lot of CubeSat um, components to the competition. And so the themes change every year, depending on how different groups are using these underwater robots. So it was just really cool to get to go to that facility and to learn all about that. Um, the picture on the left is with the Deep Discoverer or D2. That is on the Oceanus Explorer, and it is an ROV dedicated to underwater exploration. So you can see it's quite large. I'm at the front of the ROV. You can kind of see uh, the hydraulic arms on either side of me. So as it was in dry dock, uh, they let us come over and check out the full vessel, which was really exciting. So the large ship with this ROV is on. 
as well as we convinced the ROV pilot to uncover the ROV, so that's what we were really excited to see and talk to us about D2 and Sirius. And I can show you a few pictures of them if you want to see them. But they're a great resource, and they stream live. So this year, they're still slowly getting back out. They're not going to be doing a lot of ROV work. Most of it's going to be dive camp sonar. But they will be streaming live, and they've got lots of really cool videos. And what's really neat is uh, classrooms can connect. We normally have an educator on board. And you can connect with the ship while they're live out there and ask them questions about what they're doing. I don't know that they're going to be doing a lot of that this year. They're slowly getting back up to speed with COVID, all of the different regulations. Um, they are funded by your tax dollars, but it's government owned. And so they're having to follow just a lot of regulations to get it back on the water and operational. Those ships have to go through a lot of quarantine procedures. So I just wanted to show you that and tell you a little bit about myself. Now, what I would like to do before we really get started is kind of go around the room and hear a little bit about at least tell me your name, if you're a student, what grade you are, um, and what you're interested in with robotics or underwater robotics. I know you're here. So we can start if you guys don't mind. I know you were here before. If you don't mind starting to share. And if you think of a fun fact, you know something that relates that you want people to know, that's great too. So go ahead and get started for us. Uh, I'm Amy Marshall. Then to see that one, that one's lots of fun. All right, we'll go to the middle of that table. Um, Y'all will make you introduce yourself as you're walking in the door. Uh, all right, ladies up here. 
in the background. Go ahead. Okay. 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 Yes, sir. Mm -hmm. I like to be on. I'm a free school teacher and I used to teach third grade and I've taught um, seniors in high school and I teach you a little bit of everything. Mm -hmm. um, I'm getting my master's in science education and just having a lot of fun with that. And I graduate in May and um, I did the um, Endeavor STEM teachers um, mm -hmm. program. I've gotten my own. My certificate from that, I did that in December, in that December. And that was a lot of fun, and I am his mom. Excellent. Do you want to introduce yourself? Is that okay, or you want mom to do it? Exactly. Okay. That's perfect. All right, go ahead. I'm Jay Brown. I'm a homeschool teacher from Richard City. We uh, found ourselves homeschooling due to COVID. Um, she, my father was a robotics instructor here for for about 18 years, and so it was kind of a come naturally. She's the, yeah. the third in our line to be pursuing robotics. Um, she's built two or three robots already, and so when we heard about underwater or something, it saved the next couple of cells. All right, well, that's what you say. Hi, I'm Samantha Hayley Brown. I have a um, side character for a I just want to know about robotics because I want to see if I can put a camera on it, see a little spot, and go down the YouTube and see everything I can see. Mm -hmm. That's awesome. That's a great goal. All right, we'll jump back to you. Can you just want to tell us Hello, who you are? Yeah. I'm Simara I teach physics and I teach computer science. And I can give my friends a friend. And it's in my 10 years in the city of Oh, that's great. Well, thank you all for coming today. That gives us a little bit of background. And feel free. Um, so I have this first part kind of set up where we'll talk about ROVs, kind of what they are, what they do. So you have some of that background information. If you're already familiar, that's okay. Hopefully it's not too boring. Um, I love to even relearn. It helps solidify things in my brain as I'm thinking about them. So we'll talk about them for a little bit. Please ask questions. I love have interactions. So I have some questions on here for you too. So you can't just be silent and look at me today. Um, you'll have to be a little interactive. At least with students, right? You guys can handle that, right? Okay, perfect. I saw some nodding heads. And then we will switch from just me talking to we're going to pull out those robots and uh, kind of group everybody up if you're okay with that. And we will do some building. Uh, we'll take some time in here, or we can spread it outside. It was a little colder today, so I figured we'd probably do most of the building in here. And then we'll head out to the school and do some driving. Hopefully, we can get through most of that before lunch. But we've got some time. So that's kind of the first part of the morning plan. Okay. So, this is a very important question coming from a marine science background. How much of our Earth is covered in water? Yeah. Good. Right, so it's about 71%. And where is most of that water found? In our what? In our oceans. Exactly right. Now, we think about our oceans. How much of our oceans have we really explored? Let me just take a guess. What percentage do you think? Yeah. 15 percent. Good guess. Anybody have another one? Yeah. 0.5 percent. 0.5 percent. Ooh, we're getting some very different answers. Yeah. What were you going to say? 18 percent. 18 percent. So it's about 5 percent of the oceans that we estimate we've really explored. Now, if you think about the oceans, where have humans been all over the ocean? Where at? How have we really so far been out on the water? Think long-term histor historical. On the surface, right? We have covered the surface of the water. What part of the ocean do we really not know much about? The deep ocean, right? And the middle of the ocean, right? Those centered water columns, right? We don't know a lot about it. We know a lot about that first 200 meters. And a lot of that area gets what? Within that first 200 meters of the top of the water? Sunlight, right? And we know a lot about that process of sunlight and how it can help these animals survive, right? And how plants can survive underwater and how it can help those food webs, right, get going. So we think about the deep ocean and how much of the ocean there is, we really don't know that much about it. So we are working on improving that. So that D2 that I showed you, that ROV that I was standing in front of, 
that's one of the ROVs dedicated to helping increase this number, right? And there's some lofty goals that have come out for the next five, 10, 30 years of trying to completely map all of the bottom of our ocean. Right now, the scale is to an extent that we kind of have a dot maybe every football field or so. Maybe we've mapped about that much of the ocean. So we want to get more fine scale, right? There's a lot you could be missing if you're only doing every couple of football fields, taking just some single line data of mapping the bottom of our ocean. But that still doesn't include all of the life that we might find within it, right? Or all the different interactions that are happening. So what are some ways that we do explore our oceans? How do we get out and in the water? Yeah. We use a boat, we can put a camera down. What do you guys do if you go to the beach? Swim, right? We just like to go in, see for ourselves, taste, touch, right? We like to get that whole body experience. I think you had your hand up. What were you going to say? Submarines, yeah, we use submarines to explore the ocean. That's very true. Some of them are more military focused, right? But they are definitely in the water and they are collecting data, right? And using our ocean for a very specific purpose. What about if we want to get to the deep ocean? How do we get there? Yeah. Special submarines. Special submarines, that is very true. There are a few very specialized submersibles that can get us down to the bottom of the ocean, but there's very, very few, right? What happens as you go down in the ocean? Is it easy to get down there? Pressure increases, that's right. And as pressure increases, does that make it easy for our bodies to withstand that? No, right? So you really have to have some specialized equipment to get down to that deep, if you want to put someone down that deep. So there's been some really cool things like Haley's diving bell. So imagine a big bell, and this would be what the working individual would come out. This was 1691. So it's been a while since we've worn anything like this. What does it remind you of, maybe? Yeah. A robot. It does kind of look like a robot, doesn't it? It reminds me of some of the uh, diving helmets when I see that, but definitely, right, old school. He's got a pickaxe, right? So he's down there to do work underwater. I don't know that I would want to do that work underwater barefoot. So here's kind of showing you the diving bell part of that apparatus. Today, we would definitely not deem that as being safe. But at the time, right, this was top of the line innovation. You already mentioned, right, submarine. This was the French designed alligator, our first US Navy submarine. This one's pretty cool. This one's the bathosphere. We still use this technology today. What does that one look like? An eyeball. A giant eyeball. And that's exactly what it was used for, right? So you would get, there's that, that's a hatch, right? That lookout that you can see on there, that porthole is a hatch. So you would climb in there, they would rotate you in through that hatch, right? They'd seal you up and they would lower you down. Now, what can you do underwater? What's the only thing you can do once you're down there? Can you get out? No, you wouldn't want to get out. So what are you doing? You're observing the ocean and watching. Can we get good information from observation? Yeah, we can get some really good data, right, from just observing. But what else might we want to do that this doesn't allow us to do? Move around. Move around. Yeah, you don't. You can't really direct where you're going in that. That's a good point. Get out. Really obtained examples. You can't collect anything with that, right? You can see it, but you're trying to describe something and it doesn't really show lights on there. I'm not sure. I haven't read enough about it to know. Once it gets dark, right? You don't have very long to go um, before it gets really dark. So they would have to have some sort of light on there. Maybe the light was inside that he was able to shine out, but you're not going to be able to see a lot if it gets dark and you can't collect anything. And we love to collect things, right? That's how we want to know about something is we want to bring it back to the surface. So this, you know, we had the aqualung that came out in the 1940s and we have scuba diving now from that. Does anybody in here scuba dive? You people, right? It's a great way to get out, but you're still pretty limited on your depth with scuba diving, right? We can't go very deep. Um, now there are some of those that set those Guinness World Records and they go a lot deeper 
than what I go scuba diving, right? But they use some very specialized equipment. The military can go even deeper than that, but they're still limited. And so then we get to a different type of submersible. That is this one. Do you see a person on it? There's not a spot for a person on this. So a lot of times as we explore the deep ocean, we remove ourselves from it, right? So we send something else down there to make it safe so that we're not risking human life. But there are ways that we can send people to the deep ocean. So this is one, you know, one of those military suits. And what does it remind you of? I think it's really cool. A big marshmallow. A big marshmallow, right? Kind of like the Michelin man. It reminds me of an astronaut too, right? So the astronauts train underwater. This is some of that same technology, but this one is specialized to do a different type of job underwater, right? Uh, very expensive, very focused on what work that they would be doing underwater. Um, that was from the Scientific American a few years back. But the one in the center, that's our focus for today. So what do you think that one's called? Anybody know what our topic is today? This is an ROV. Anybody know what that stands for? Well, you guys probably do. Anybody else want to take a guess? Close. So it is vehicle at the end. No, it has to do with how you drive it. The R. Remote. So it is a remotely or remote operated vehicle or ROV. Now I did, one of the main things we always think about is getting people to the bottom of the oceans. And this is one of the most famous ones. Has everybody heard of the Alvin before? Yes, excellent. I love to see the Alvin out, see what it's doing. It has done some great things for us as far as exploration. If you've ever seen any of those cool original videos, footage from the Titanic, that was all brought to you by the Alvin. And then the Alvin was driving a small ROV that was able to go inside and get some of those amazing footage of the Grand Staircase and some of those rooms. It was known as the Jason Jr. So this is an updated photo of the Alvin. It's gone under a few um, renovations in the past few years so that it could go deeper and just to meet some new safety standards. That bathysphere, that eye, is right inside of there and it's covered with other materials. So again, you can't get out, but what did they do to this bathysphere? What's on the front of it? I know it's a little hard to see. Yeah. Claws as rats. Claws. So they may be stuck inside, but now they can take samples, right? So they can collect and bring things back. And it holds three people. Um, they can stay down for about nine hours. It's pretty cool. Um, I've never gotten to see the album in person. A few of the other people I work with have gotten to go up to Woods Hole um, and do a tour where they could see the Alvin um, inside when it was getting um, some of its renovation work done. So the Titanic's probably one of the most famous ones for us in marine science. The Alvin let us understand and learn more about hydrothermal vents. We did not know that these existed before the Alvin went down and saw them in person. So sometimes, no matter what you can do until you can actually see something, right? We just don't know what's down there. And then now the Alvin can take samples of some of those smokestacks, right? So collect some of that intense heat water coming from below the surface or intense cold, right? There are cold seeps as well. Um, and so they'll make different specialized equipment to help collect some of that or to collect those mineral deposits. Those are what those chimneys are, right? Deposits of different minerals. And there are groups interested in deep sea mining now because we know that these are there and these are mineral deposits. Um, and so they want to remove those from the ocean. Um, but it's just really cool, right? Learning about those chemosynthetic communities that we didn't know existed. So one other type of human occupied vehicle, that's that term HOV that the Alvin fits into. These are the submersibles that have been to the deepest place in the ocean. Does anybody know where that is? Where is our deepest place? Anybody know the name of the trench? Or within the trench, there's a specific name. Anybody ever heard of the Marianas Trench? Yes, so that is our deepest trench. If you look at this map, it is over here in dive four, so it's in the Pacific Ocean. And this shows you a little bit of a graphic of the Marianas Trench. And what's really cool about it is Mount Everest, right? The largest mountain we have on Earth as far as heights goes, can fit down inside of it and not reach the surface. So when you think about extreme conditions, 
Climbing Mount Everest is pretty extreme. So imagine what it's like to try to send people to the bottom of the deepest place in the ocean. And that's what these vehicles here have done. So I have the three different vehicles that have been to the deepest place in the ocean down into the Challenger Deep, which is the deepest point within it. This one is a French name. I think it's Trice, but I could be saying that one wrong. What does it look like to you guys? You may think it looks like a blimp. That's what it reminds me of. Um, and it had weight on the bottom of it, so ballast weight to lower it down. It released that ballast and was slowly able to return to the surface. I think that one had two men on board. Back in 2015, this submersible here in the left, this one is known as the Deep Sea Challenger, so named after the deepest place in the ocean, went down. You can watch this documentary. It's really interesting. It focuses on the engineering behind this submersible build. There was a lot of delays, a lot of issues, different things they had to overcome. Cost always increases more than you think it's going to do, but National Geographic helped sponsor that. And you can watch some pretty interesting videos. Now, James Cameron was kind of the brain behind it and spent a lot of his money on it. Does anybody know James Cameron? What did he do? What does he do? He's still alive. <laughs> He's a famous movie director. So if you have gone and watched Terminator movies, or maybe more recently you've watched Titanic, or even more recently you've seen Avatar, those are all James Cameron movies. So if you are supporting him in the movie theater, you are supporting his underwater research that he likes to do, which is pretty cool. Um, so this was his big project back from 2015, but it was made to go to the bottom of the ocean one time. So he did one expedition, a lot, a lot of work. Most recently, so last year he was on the news some, if you were watching the news for things other than COVID. Um, I know that was hard to find, but he did make the news a few times. He was even on, I think it was world news. I don't know that I ever saw it on my local news, but it was definitely on some news sites that I saw. This is Victor Vescovo. He's a former Navy man from the US, and he worked with a group called Triton Submersibles out of South Florida, and they created the limiting factor to do this expedition map up here. So if you notice, there are five different places listed. He wanted to dive the five deepest places in each ocean, right? So he has built a submersible with this group that can continuously dive over and over to the deepest points all over the world. He did several dives in the Marianas Trench, not just one, and he took down an astronaut. So there was a famous astronaut that got to go down with him, and I can't think of her name right now. I got to watch her on a webinar. The only good thing that came out of COVID is now you can watch a lot of these webinars live and join some of them. So I got to listen to him talk about his expedition. I got to watch one on the uh, engineering behind the build of the limiting factor, and then I got to listen to the astronaut talk about her going down with Victor Vescovo to the deepest part of the Earth. So she's done outer space and now inner space, which is just really, really cool. And he's still diving. So he did this challenge, and then he had just kept going and coming up with these new challenges for himself. He was one that did all of the big mountains around the world, climbed all of them, needed a new challenge, Navy background wanted to do the ocean. But it's really cool because now we have a submersible that can repeat dives. So we have the Alvin, the Alvin can't go into the trenches, but this one can. But the cost behind it is really extreme. But this is just one vehicle, right? This is the only one that can do this around the world. Um, so it's pretty limited. I know Japan and Russia are also working on some deep diving submersibles, but a lot of times they do one mission, they have so many problems, they have to kind of redesign and redo it. So the technology is slowly getting there. So this is pretty exciting. And they will be, um, Discovery Channel will be doing a release of Victor Vescovo's challenge. It's supposed to come out this year unless they push it back with COVID, but it'll be a really cool documentary series on TV talking about everything that he discovered and found underwater. So I just wanted to highlight that because it's a big thing in deep diving, right? Okay, so now let's talk about our ROV. So this is one, this is a large ROV. Anybody want to take a guess on kind of size? What would you compare that size wise to? Big, small, what do you think? Big, right? Think large SUV, right? Some of them can be um, eight or nine feet long and wide and about 11 feet tall. So that's about the D2's dimensions. 
Um, so think large SUV, right? And thousands of pounds, like Asian elephant weight. Very, very heavy pieces of equipment. Um, for some of them, the ones that go into the deeper oceans are about this size. The ones we're gonna build are gonna look like the one at the end of the table over here, right? It's still an ROV. It still has the same basic parts. So this is another type of submersible, but the ROVs hold people. They don't, right? So this is the class we call non-HOV or non-human occupied vehicles. There's another type of vehicle that fits in that. It's not an ROV. Does anybody know what the other type is? It's called an AUV. They are autonomous, so they are pre-programmed. So those of you that might be in STEM and you really enjoy coding, or learning about computers, that may be right up your alley as well. And there are ROVs that can also run autonomously. So they're actually hybrid versions of the two. So you need all of that information. You need to know how to operate the robot. You might need to know some of the mechanical engineering behind it, and you might need to know some coding. So it's kind of an all-in-one type job. Yes? So does the weight matter for them? Like, if they go down, do they need to be so you do want it to be heavy, right, to be able to A, sink, right, and B, withstand the current, but what else do they have to think about? What happens as you go deeper in the ocean? He mentioned it earlier. You want to say it again? Pressure gets higher. So a lot of times if you look at its body, right, you can see maybe a lot of um, metal on here. And so that is able to withstand some of that pressure. And we'll talk about some of the other parts. Um, because all of this has to withstand that pressure. Now, that's a good point, though, right? Thinking about the weight. And you'll have to think about weight and buoyancy when you build your ROV here in a little bit. Now, these are operated, right? Not by somebody on the ROV. Where is the operator or the pilot? Yes. On land. They could be on land. That would be really new technology. If he's out in the ocean, where is that pilot? On a, boat. on a boat. There we go. So it's on that large vessel, right? I think really big ship. Um, sometimes almost cruise ship size, right? Some of the vessels are really, really big to be able to hold these ROVs off on a crane and lower them into the water and just support all of the staff that they need. So that pilot gets to stay nice and dry, right? He's in a nice control room. If any of you are really good at gaming or you even like to do VR, a lot of these pilots that way, right? So when you're driving this ROV, can you see it? No, right? It can be thousands of meters below you, thousands of feet below you. It can be really far down in the ocean. So you're driving it from a computer screen with a nice joystick, right? And controllers can look very, very different. So some of our small controllers are very simple, right? You have switches. This one has a circuit board that you would have to attach components to to drive. This one is just simple two-way switches. And then if you get a little bit fancier, and I'll take this one outside with us later too, this controller is gonna seem like probably something you guys might be more familiar with. This is my ROV controller. What does this look like? A video game controller, right? But this is how I drive my ROV and this is my screen so I can see what the ROV is seeing. Now, some of them actually have joysticks, and others of them will have, and Kevin may be able to show us some different options on his. So look at the remotes and what they have. I saw some at the International a few years ago where the arm also had its own controller, where they would wear kind of like the hand for the controller, and they would operate it that way as well. So they had the joystick here, and the hand was attached to their hand, right, and they were the claw as well. So really cool. I've seen the ROVs driven by the VR set. So the technology is just jumping leaps and bounds these last few years as the, the technology increases and it's made more readily available for students as well as for different government jobs, right, or these different groups exploring. Now the communication is one of the biggest limiting factors for this. If this is thousands of meters below you, how are you going to really operate it? How are you going to be connected to it? Does anybody know, does Wi-Fi work underwater? Does our 5G network work underwater? Unfortunately, no, right? So we have to be connected through a large cable. So our small ROVs, this one's made to go to a 12 foot pool straight to the bottom, right? It doesn't have a lot of extra with it. This is that umbilical cord or tether. 
You might hear either name. So Ray showed you a chunk of one of the umbilical cables from one of these large ROVs. This is what it looks like. And this is missing the outer coating, right, that protects it from pressure, from water, from a curious animal, right, that might try to figure out what this is. And it helps a little bit with buoyancy, right? So think of something kind of um, rubbery that's going to help it float. Because this is going to get heavy. If my ROV goes to 6,000 meters underwater, how much tether do I have to have? At least 6,000 meters, right? And probably more because it's not going to sink straight down, right? It's going to be at an angle underwater. You're going to be fighting a little bit of current and different currents as you go down with those different water layers. So this is that umbilical. So this one here is going to be for power for the ROV. So what I don't have to put on the ROV that you might have to think about with your land robot is that you have to have that battery on board or that power source on board to your robot. It can add some serious weight to your ROV. So they don't have to have that on the ROV. Now, if you are autonomous vehicles, though, you do have to have it on there, right? Because then you don't have to have this cable, but you're pre-programmed. A lot of those look more torpedo shaped um, or kind of like that blimp. Um, and they have the battery. And the battery component takes up most of the available space, as well as whatever sensors they have on it to collect data. So you'll notice there are other tubes, too. A lot of these hold different fluids, the so different hydraulic fluids. Some of them will be warm to help keep the robot operational, and some of them go to the hydraulic arm. Some of the other power cables are going to go to what else do you think would need to be powered on the robot? Besides just giving it power, for it to see things underwater, what's it going to need on it? A camera. And then for that camera to see anything in the dark, it's going to need night vision or light, right? And maybe different types of light, maybe some red light so we can see things in color, right? We lose color as you go underwater. So if you've ever gone deep sea fishing and you caught a red snapper, it's red where we can see it at the surface. Underwater, it's totally camouflaged, right? It lives where nothing can see its color. So it just disappears into the water, um, which is kind of cool. But we want to see things how they, you know, what we think of how they really look, not just black and white. So you can see the lights on this ROV. And obviously, this is not taken, this picture from the ROV, right? This is taken from another vehicle down there so that it can see it. So that communication is important via the tether cable. Working class to micro in size. So this is a big ROV, right? This one, you might say, is mini. There are micro ROVs, and um, hopefully Kevin has one. I think with his group, they had to have one. Micro ROVs are about like this. They get really small to fit into the size of pipes. So if you think of a large diameter PVC pipe, maybe something that your local water company might use or have for some of their sewage, they make small ROVs or operational underwater vehicles that have maybe wheels that can roll through the pipes to be able to go and investigate those pipes. And so one of the challenges three years ago now, because we didn't do a competition last year, two years ago, I'm sorry, I'll stay over near the camera, um, <laughs> um, was to have the students also make a micro ROV that could come off of their main ROV and go through a pipe to investigate that pipe and come back out and go back onto the other ROV. So you can do some amazing things with different sizes of ROVs and maybe have multiples working together. This would be considered professional, but we're going to be working with today will be more hobby ROV, right? I help students build these ROVs. And so you guys are going to get a taste of that today. We won't do the wiring part, but we will do the design of the body of the ROV. And then they're used for everything, right? We might just want to explore underwater. Being a you know marine scientist background, I want to know about the different animals down there, the different changes in the water. So being able to collect all of that data and see it and bring back samples is important to us. My husband works in a lab that uses an ROV, and he's a fishery scientist. So he studies red snapper for his job, but they take out an ROV and study the artificial reefs off the coast of Alabama to learn all about those fish without actually having to collect them. Now, they do still get to fish. Don't worry, he gets to fish for a living, but he also helps process that ROV data and drive it sometimes. Yeah. So, 
No, you're not going to take them home today, but maybe you can get one for yourself. That would be really cool if I could have given you guys ROEs, wouldn't it? And there, we're going to build them about the size of that one. So I didn't bring anything to make micro ROEs. I've seen some. You could make them with little vibrating motors, like from the size of your phone, um, and add little propellers onto them. I'll have to maybe try to find a picture to show you. Um, I met one of the regional coordinators who does what I do here that works in Hawaii, and he makes some little micro ROVs, and they're pretty cool. So here's kind of showing you, so this is the big Hercules. This is the D2 that I was standing in front of. This is it at night, so it kind of looks grainy. Um, and there's the front of it. But you can see over on the scale that there are some quite large ROVs to some very, very small ones. This is the one I have in the case on the end, and he's about this big. And so then they increase mostly to scale. Um, just wanted to show you some differences and varieties in the ROV. Okay, so this is that ship I talked to you about. I wanted to show you, I know this is a small picture. If you can see all those different computer monitors, that is the control room to help operate that ROV. There's a lot of people in there that have jobs to help support that ROV and the work that it's doing. So that ROV collects a lot of data. So some of those people are working on mapping, some of them are scientists on board who are looking at the footage and helping to identify what they're seeing. There's a pilot. There's a couple of engineers. There is somebody just helping with communication, right? Making sure everybody knows what's going on, communicating with the captain, communicating with the ROV pilot. On, a, on average, I think there's at least 20 to 25 people in that room when they go out helping to operate that ROV and to help start to analyze that data. There's also sometimes an educator they have on board that could be in this control room as well, um, taking a log or recording live video that the students can be watching about what's going on in that room. So it's pretty cool. This is the large ship. This is how it communicates via satellite and do all of its live stream, that giant ball on it. There's the D2. It has a second ROV called Sirius, but its only job is to, A, it kind of helps. It's midway down the tether. So it helps with some of the pull, helps relieve some of that strain on the tether, but it's the lights that shine down over the ROV and it's taking other video footage of the ROV at a distance so they can see where the ROV is, not just video from the ROV. So it's pretty cool to get to see that. And this is showing you what mapping looks like underwater. So the different colors relate to different depths. And I can show you a couple of videos if you guys want to see videos um, from the D2. Here's a few other pictures. So this kind of shows you everything together. The ship with Sirius and the ROV. Here's Sirius. Sirius is probably from here to here and from the height up to here. So a much smaller ROV. Um, they really kind of call it a video sled, but they can pilot it as well. Um, it is connected to the tether. Here's a few of the screens and you can see they're all looking at slightly different things that they are keeping up with. You know, some of one of the engineers for the ROV is just watching the data is collecting. How are we on pressure? How are we on temperature? How is everything on board the ROV? Are we hurting it as we are down there? How is it doing operationally? Um, while the pilot is getting instructions from the scientist or from the ship captain about where that ROV needs to move. So pretty cool. Just a few more types of ROVs so you can get kind of in your head what they look like and begin thinking about what maybe you want your ROV that you're gonna build to look like. So this is that large working class, like the D2. Observation class, a couple of us could pick one up. So it's probably maybe a little bit wider, but the size of those tables width-wise and would stand up about like this. So kind of that size I mentioned of cereals, some of those are there, but you can see 300 pounds would be pretty heavy. We would definitely need a few of us to pick them up and operate them. So these are all different ones you can buy. The mini class ROV, the price range for that um, high is about 100000 and then it gets down to much better prices. Um, obviously, especially when you get to hobby, right? My ROV is nowhere near that $100,000 category. And then the micro ROV is pretty new, um, and they're still kind of changing. Those can be hobby as well as there's a few groups that are starting to make those for water companies or for a sheriff's department, I've heard as well, that police, some police departments in areas um, are getting these as well, which is very new. 
This is a really cool one. Notice it's totally different in design. It's round. I tried to drive one of these one time, and I'm used to that kind of boxy shape moving, and this one will spin in a circle. So you touch the controller and it just backflips for you. So it definitely is very different to operate than the other body style as it's moving, you know, on the X, Y, and Z planes. This one is used mainly in aquaculture. So they sell it. If you buy any food, any fish that are grown in some of those aquaculture ponds, they use are really common over in Europe. They're not as common yet in the US. I think they're starting to sell them off the Northeast um, for some of their aquaculture ponds. I don't know of any in the South that are being used. A lot of ours are still more inland ponds. These are some of the ones that they use for the ocean um, enclosures that they have. Uh, but they can go and do fish inspections and see what's on there. They can check for lesions on fish, make sure the fish health is good. They can see um, if anything else has gotten in there, they can check the enclosures and check the nets and things like that that they're in. These are some of those larger observation class ones. We have this one at the Sea Lab. It's kind of an older technology now. They've updated this a little bit. And they have one now about this size that the fisheries lab at the Sea Lab uses. Um, some of the different groups that use them that you might think of, military, right? Thinking about missiles and mines. They also just use them for bottom work. You can use them to check the size of your ship. So the Navy has some where they can do ship, inspe ship inspections without sending a person in the water. They can send down an ROV and check on the sides of the ship or when they come into port, seeing how they are working. I've mentioned marine science. Oil and gas industry is huge, right, in the Gulf of Mexico. All of these companies have ROVs um, that they have either this is from the Deepwater Horizon oil spill to help cap the oil spill, right? To calculate the volume of the gas that's coming out. They use these ROVs for many different things. You can see the hydraulic arm there. They're trying to actually operate it. They use these ROVs to help lay down the different pipelines to help with the drilling on the bottom. All of them have to do surveys before they can put in a new oil or gas rig. And so they could use an AUV and then if they see something, they have to go back with an ROV and check it out. Because um, the AUV, you know, does emissions, pops up and they get the data later, so then they have to go back out and see. Um, especially for shipwrecks. So we do have quite a few shipwrecks in the Gulf of Mexico and we don't know where all of them are. We know we're still missing U-boats from World War II, things like that. Um, so they can't put a rig where there is loss of life, right? Those become preserved locations and so they have to really be aware of where shipwrecks are. There's a whole group of people that do marine archaeology. So if any of you are interested in that too. It's a very, very wide field. It's growing. Some of our cables that we have that connect this internationally, they run across the bottom of the ocean. ROVs are what do some of the inspection for that. They can do some sonar scanning to see if those cables are in place. But if they get exposed, they have to send down ROVs. So we have satellites in space. We also have cables that run across all of our oceans that connect us. So it's a huge and growing field in marine technology, right, to do all these different things. So to give you an example from the Sea Lab again, so this is from our fisheries group. You can see the ROV here. That's one of the fishing methods, right? You guys have probably maybe heard of deep sea fishing, right, hook and line. So they do lots of different hooks this way. You can tow a big net. This is called a trawl net. And this is a bottom long line. And then over here is just taking some sonar data. So this could be an AUV. Um, ours is actually connected to the bottom of the boat and it can do sonar underneath it. So there's a whole lot that can go into fisheries work. So even if you like the fish side or the biology side, you can still use this really cool technology. So this is from that ROV. You can see the laser. What would the lasers tell them? They're not trying to fry the fish. What might they use two lasers for? Um, you check the fish's health, how warm and how cold they are. Oh, so you could use it as a sensor, yeah, to try to get some data from it. That's not what they do, but that's a great idea, and I think they do have some that do that. What would be another reason to have two lasers kind of side by side like that? Yes, so to take size. So these are 10 centimeters apart, so without ever catching this fish, they can estimate fork length, right? So a measurement from here to the tip of the mouth. 
that's important for them, right? If you've ever gone fishing, you know you have to catch fish within certain size classes, right? You can't get one undersized or oversized. Um, for some of them, not all of them have those small of a window. But from this, because they've caught so many fish, they can also estimate its weight. So then they can get length, weight, frequency. So then they get to do some fun online math, right? Different calculations that they get to do as a scientist, just from, right, taking some video of this artificial reef that's in the background. You can see the measurement lined up on this red snapper. It doesn't look very red down here, does it? This is a red snapper though. So you can see they have lost that color, even though they do have some white light shining on them. And this just shows you two different reefs offshore. Okay, so I do want to at least show you guys one video um, of another type of technology on an ROV. This is that one that says slurp. I'm going to see if I can get it to work. Okay, I don't know if we'll have sound with it. I think I might have turned the sound off. Let me... No, that's okay. So this is a type of squid that you can see here. I can't remember what kind it is. I would have had to hear it again. But they have found this on the ROV and they have decided that they want to try to collect it. So this ROV has a new attachment on it called a suction sampler. That basically can think about a vacuum sucking something up, right, to be able to collect it. So this is a soft-bodied animal. Would it be able to collect easily with a claw? No, so they've been trying to come up with different devices to collect, especially swimming animals, right? They're not gonna hold still for you to bring a claw to them or even a soft rubberized claw. So this is that tube, think about it as like a vacuum tube. And they're gonna turn it on and it's gonna slurp up that little squid and it goes straight into a collection chamber that they can then seal and it'll rotate. And so now they've collected that live squid sample. And it is still alive, right? So I think it's slightly pressurized chamber. I'm not sure. I mean, it pulled that water in with it as well. So it at least has the same water that it was in. And they are able to now study this squid that they weren't able to collect before. You think about trawling and some of the other ways we collect things, it destroys soft samples, right? So this is great for jellyfish, for things like squid, for octopus. So there's lots of other technologies that get stuck on these ROVs, which I just think is really really cool. Um, I got to use a suction sampler for part of my work, but not in deep water. I was in shallow seagrass beds. So this is much cooler um, to get to see them collecting it. Okay. And I can always show you guys more videos. If we have time later, there's lots of cool ones. Um, this one's really good. It shows you the ROV. It's really funny with sound because the scientists get so excited. Um, this one has another neat type of technology. I don't know. Let me see if I can copy it and put it in. So have any of you studied bioluminescence or heard that term before? Yes, what is bioluminescence? Right, so certain animals, right, and even plants and fungi, right, can create their own light. So bio meaning life, right, and that lumen in there tells you light, right? And some of them can be different chemical processes. They're not all the same. But in the deep ocean, there's a lot of bioluminescence, right? They have to make their own light if they want to be able to see different things or communicate. We think some animals do bioluminescence to maybe find a mate. We think some of them do it to find prey. And some of them do it as maybe just a warning, right? hey, get away from me, you know, have different bioluminescence, or it can be a distraction for that animal to get away, right, from a predator. So this is a video of a type of technology. I'm going to pause it. So here, this was created by a scientist who studies bioluminescence, and she created this is a light. And if I back it up, see that the light is running in a ring? So there's a jellyfish called the burglar alarm jellyfish. Um, that's what it's commonly referred to. It says full of jellyfish. Um, and it makes this signal if it's getting attacked by something to attract a larger predator to come and take away its predator, right? So it's kind of a chain reaction. Something attacks it, trying to eat it. 
and it's going to set off this burglar alarm, hoping to attract something bigger to come and take away what's trying to eat it, and then it can get away. So this scientist created a device to try to find a giant squid, and she was successful. So the giant squid is coming in. It thinks there's something attacking this jellyfish. So it's testing, reaching, looking for it, swiping around, right? And it's not going to find its prey. But what's really cool is we finally got to see a giant squid, right? So she is the scientist. She did it a few years before this off the coast of Japan. It was the first time we had seen a live giant squid, right? And it took her creating this imitation jellyfish technology for us to be able to do that, which is really cool. This one was from the Gulf of Mexico. So we do have giant squid in the Gulf of Mexico. Twilight zone is not the deepest part of the ocean. The Gulf of Mexico doesn't get too deep. It's that area just below the zone where we get light. So it wasn't even super, super deep down there, but it is dark, right, mostly. And so that's where that giant squid was feeding, which was really, really cool. This was from, I think, three years ago. Not long now. Last year always throws me off. Um, but I actually got to go and see her speak. She came down to Mobile um, and did a, a big presentation down there and talked about her technology and how she's incorporating that into her research now. It was really cool um, to see that. So some other fun technologies. I won't just bore you with other cool videos um, that I think are cool. So what I want to do now is I want to do our ROV activity. And this, if you can see, are what some of the ROVs look like that we've had at, at my competition. Um, so you can see they don't always look the same. The ROVs can look very, very different. And now I don't get to have um, Kevin McCone's team come to my competition. He has the college student level and they are not required to come to a regional competition. So all of these are elementary, middle, and high school ROVs. And they're pretty phenomenal, right? Some of them look pretty basic. And then some of them you can tell have gotten a lot more advanced. Now, just because they look more advanced doesn't mean they work any better than some of these really simple ones. Uh, one of the things that sometimes the more you learn about it and the more you practice and if you keep it simple, sometimes it works much better. Now, you're not going to have time today to make any of these that are made out of other materials. Um, this one is actually cutting boards on the side. This one was designed in CAD. This one's acrylic. This was similar, so it's that same type of plastic that they make cutting boards out of, um, but they bought larger sheets of that plastic. Um, same thing with this one. And then a lot of the rest of them are PVC. This was two different types of, I don't know what they call it, but what you're calling it's, it's like a colander. So one of them is a colander, and then they also use the part from a fan that covers the blades on a fan. They took that apart and use that for part of it, and then they had a colander as well. So you can make ROVs out of all kinds of materials, right? And they're trying to do this to make them neutrally.